Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, or whatever time it is where you are. I'm Jonathan Hall. Today I'm going to do another Go code road. The basic concept is I look at some code written in Go that I've never seen before, and I comment on it, uh, what I like, what I don't like. So just a few weeks ago, I did my first Go code Rose video. Link up there. Today, though, the code I'm looking at, uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm told that it is probably non-idiomatic Go. So I'm going to just talk about uh, the, the Go idioms that I find in this code. If this is something that would be helpful on your team, I also do this professionally. I can come and coach your team, uh, look at the code that you've written. Maybe you switch to Go from a different tech stack. I'd be happy to help you. Um, you can go to jhall.io to contact me. I'll have some links in the description, of course. If you like this video, be sure to like it, uh, or if it's educational, and be sure to subscribe too for more videos like this one. So today's code comes from Jorman on GitHub. And Jorman uh, described his code as a Go version of Mozilla's readability.js library. He says the code is full of non-idiomatic code, which is great for roasting. And who knows, maybe I'll get famous. So let's see if we can get you famous here, Jorman. Thanks for submitting your code. It takes a little bit of courage to uh, submit yourself to a roast like this. So uh, the, the package is really quite simple. Uh, you can see here, it just has three Go files, helpers.go, readability.go, and then a test file. Um, it's not packaged as a uh, module, although you can see the package was originally three years old, so that might make sense. It wasn't, I don't know if packages even existed. They certainly weren't ubiquitous yet. Um, the most recent commit was just three months ago. So that would be my first uh, suggestion, is make it a module. Um, of course, it still works with modern versions of Go, even if it's not a module, but since we're roasting, make it a module. Uh, let's just read the description here. The library written in Go, of course, to parse, analyze, and convert HTML pages into readable content. Okay. I'm going to start here. In readability.go, it looks like the main place to go. So we're just using standard library uh, imports. That's great, except for this golang slash, uh, golang.org slash x, which is sort of an extension of the standard library, semi-official packaging. So that's nice that there aren't any third-party dependencies. Before I move on, though, let me check the other files. Helpers, same same dependencies, and the tester, and the test file, also the same. So it's completely standard library uh, dependent uh, package. That's great. Uh, I love that. So big, big points for that. All right, a bunch of regular expressions. Um, I'm not a big fan of regular expressions, but there are times when they're appropriate, and, and this might be one of them. Um, considering that this is a copy of an existing library that was written in JavaScript, I, I would imagine that these regular expression, expressions were just copied from there. Uh, so that probably makes sense to do it that way, uh, rather than reinventing the wheel and doing something uh, different. Um, if I were writing this from scratch, I would, I would personally, I would try to avoid regular expressions whenever possible. Uh, they're they're just too error prone. They're too hard to read. Uh, I mean, it, it even I've I've been using regular expressions for for many years, and even even this like it, it takes a while. I have to think about what this means to understand it. So the the cognitive burden on expre on regular expressions is high. Um, it's also really easy to do a very inefficient regular expression. If you put a, a dot star or something like that, uh, you can you can gobble megabytes or gigabytes of memory. Many years ago, I was working on a mail uh, scanning uh, process, so scan for basically for uh, spam. And uh, our uh, a customer entered a regular expression into the block uh, pattern, and we started our servers started crashing. All of our servers were crashing. Basically, they had a dot star word dot star or something like that, and and that pattern was causing the regular expression engine to slurp gigabyte email attachments into memory. Uh, multiple times to, to try to look for this word. Uh, so we, we had to fix that, uh, of course. Uh, but it's just an example of how easy it can be to accidentally, without realizing what you're doing, use huge amounts of CPU, huge amounts of memory. So these are reasons I prefer to avoid regular expression. Having said that, there are times when they're appropriate. This is probably one of those times, mainly because, as I said, we are copying a lot, an existing library. And re-implementing this with a different pattern without regular expressions would make the difference between the two libraries much bigger and harder to compare the two. So that would be my main reason for using regular expressions here. If Again, if this were a, a library I was writing from scratch, I would try not to use regular expressions at all or use them only when necessary. For, for example, this uh, to check if uh, a string contains 
uppercase or lowercase word share, just use a string contains, uh, <laughs> strings dot contain, uh, or, or something like that. You know, there, there are simpler, more direct, less error prone ways to do most regular expression checks. So enough ranting about regular expressions. I, I, I don't like them for the most part, but they're probably still appropriate given the larger context. They're probably appropriate in this case. Actually, before I move on, I'm going to jump back. I'm going to look at the tests and see what kind of tests we have here. I should also download the package and run the test locally. So there are another example why this should be a module. Uh, it needs to be a module to run stuff locally. I can initialize the module easily though. So I, I wanted to run my test with a, a race detector. I wouldn't expect a race in a package this small, but it's still a good test. 47% test coverage. Not great, but it's not bad. Of course, it, the, the percentage of test coverage isn't the most important thing. There's really only two tests. So they're more integration tests than, than unit tests, but maybe, maybe that's okay. I'll have to look at the other code first. But given that we only had 47% coverage, I'm pretty certain that it's not fully tested. So back to our package variable de uh, declarations. Uh, kudos, by the way, for these being unexported. Uh, if these were exported, that would be a big red flag since they're just used internally. The documentation looks good. I like that we're using Go doc style documentation here. Um, and, and yes, defined here so we don't instantiate the repeatedly loops. Definitely a good idea. If I saw these being instantiated on every use, I would I would throw rocks at my screen. That would be bad. Okay, now now we're getting to the heart of the matter here. It looks like parse attempt is a container for the result of the previous parse attempt. Okay. Um, and then here, readability is, is the parser itself with the with its various configuration options. So user configurable elements uh, or parameters to the readability struct match elements to parse. This is fairly well documented here. And then an article is the metadata, the result of a parsing, I believe. All right, and new just returns a default uh, readability I'm going to skip over this function right now and I want to follow the flow of the program. So after we call new, then someone has to use, you know, make a call to this readability struct. So that's going to be an exported uh, method. Let's find one of those and see what it does. This is where the go doc would come in handy. So let's pull that up. If you're, if you're not familiar with Go, uh, anytime you publish a, a, a package publicly on, on GitHub or GitLab or, or whatever, it is essentially automatically a publicly available uh, package. So if you go to pkg.go.dev, you can look at the Go doc for it. So here we go. So with, uh, with new, we create our, read our, our readability uh, struct, and then there's two exported methods, is readable and parse. So um, actually, I'm just gonna click on this. There's a nice little shortcut here. If you click on, if you're reading the Go doc, uh, at least on this site, on pkg.go.dev, you can just click on the function name and it takes you to the source which is right where we were, but it, it's super handy there. So this is apparently the main uh, core. Uh, well, no, this is not the main. This is one of the two functions. The main one is the next one, but I'll start with this one. So this one decides whether the document is usable or not without parsing the whole thing. Okay. So let's see what this does. It parses the document using the HTML uh, package. Uh, if there's an error, it returns false. Good enough. If there's not an error, then it does a little bit of checking here. So I don't know if this comment is copied from the original library, but I would rather have a comment that explains why it's doing this, which it just doesn't really do. Um, it explains what it's doing. The fact that the author thought that we needed to explain what it's doing tells me the code should be re refactored. My general rule for comments is if you need to explain your code with a comment, you haven't written your code clearly enough. Uh, however, it is appropriate to explain why you're doing something in code, but if you have to explain the what you're doing, just refactor your code to be more clear. Uh, so, you know, for example, this, this uh, inline function, maybe turn it into an external function. I don't know. I'll, I'll look in, I haven't looked at the details yet, but I, I would find a way to refactor this code to make this comment unnecessary. Uh, and I would likely add a comment to explain why 
I'm caring about the P and pre nodes and divs of VR nodes and, and stuff like that. You know, wh why is that important? I, I'm, it's not obvious to me why. But let's continue reading the code. So this is just a, uh, an inline function. Um, I'm not sure why it's done that way. Why this isn't just made a package function? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I suppose it's because it's a closure, but still you could just have it return these things, I guess. But let me see how this is used. It's only called once right here, so I'm I'm sure that it's intended to be a closure. Yeah, it's it's modifying these values, but I I would just make this. I think it would be much more readable, and it wouldn't have me going what the heck when I'm reading this. Um, if you would just make this a package function, and have it return these values rather than modifying them in line, there's no reason for it to be a closure. Uh, maybe this was copied from the original JavaScript. Um, if that's the case, uh, maybe that makes sense in JavaScript. I don't think so, but but even if it does, it doesn't make sense in Go. So definitely, I would I would make this a a separate function of its own uh, and just have it return the node list and node dict rather than modifying them as as a closure. Oh, I see. It, it does call itself, so that's um, so it's a recursive function. Uh, so it would need to take these arguments as input ra rather than output, but still I would make it an external function, uh, or uh, not external, but, a, but a, a separate function, a package function. Making this a package function would just improve the readability of the code, I, I believe. And then I want to give it a name that actually describes what it's doing. Um, find, you know, but basically give it a name that makes this comment obsolete. Um, and it would probably answer the why as well. Uh, find renderable nodes or something like that. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what it's doing, but but if we called it that, uh, we probably would have the, the comments problem solved as well. So here we call this function sum node on a node list. The node list is what we built in the closure. And for each one of those, we decide whether it should be visible, I guess. So this code is more or less readable. I mean, I, I don't know why it says sum node. It's a funny name for a, a, a method. Does it mean next node? I'll, I'll look into that in a minute, but I, I think this should be more clearly named. Uh, I like this. It's probably visible. That, that That's more or less descriptive, I think. I mean, I haven't seen what the code does, but it, reading this, I can understand the flow of, of this code, so that's fine. If it's not probably visible, we return false. Good enough. If it is probably visible, then we continue doing some, some determination here. Uh, we look for the class name and the ID. Um, and then here we do one of the regular expression checks that we saw defined at the top, actually two of them. And if either of these match, we return false. Just some basic heuristics to determine if, if these nodes should not be uh, displayed, I, I guess. So I'm gonna guess that what this sum node does is it just goes through a list of nodes until there's a, a positive match. And if we get one positive match, it, re it early exits the return. So let's go verify if that's true. Some nodes, some node iterates over a node list, return true if any of the provider iteration calls. Yep. So my guess was correct. Uh, this name could be much improved. Um, in fact, I don't know if it needs to be a function at all. I might, I might just do that in line in a loop. I mean, it just hides complexity to do it that way. Uh, so yeah, I would probably delete this function and just have an inline loop. Then it would be completely clear to anybody reading the code that it's returning true on the first success. Um, other than that, uh, if you want to keep it a separate function, I would give it a name that's more descriptive than some node. First match or uh, any node matches, I, I don't know, come, come up with a better name that, that, that tells the reader exactly what's going on without having to read the code. Uh, let's go back here. I also wanted to look at is probably visible. Let's see what that one does. So it's basically just checking whether or not the style has hidden is hidden, uh, which is I guess reasonable. Um, and if it is hidden, then it returns false. So so that's the is readable. It, it's basically it looks for the first instance of a readable element, and as soon as it finds it, it returns true. Otherwise, it continues parsing. If it gets to the entire document, and finds nothing, it returns false. Now let's look at the actual parse uh, method, which is the core of this library. So it takes an IO reader and a page URL string and returns an article and or an error. So we reset the parser data. Okay, I'm not sure why we do that. That means that these parsers are not 
reusable, maybe that's okay. Um, I mean, it, it's a it's a design decision. Um, I think I would prefer to have that state kept independently so that I could use the same parser for multiple documents without changing the parser state. That just seems kind of dirty to me. Um, so I would, yeah, I would probably instantiate these variables on a per call basis, unless they're useful after the parse returns, in which case they maybe should be inside of article. I just don't like the idea of modifying the readability object every time we call parse. For one thing, that means it's not concurrency safe. You can't call the same instance of readability multiple times concurrently without a, a data race and a crash. So uh, that needs to be clearly documented. It should be documented right here uh, in this go doc, if that's the case, if that's the choice you make. But I think a better choice is just to make it concurrency safe and not store these things in the parser. I, I don't know why they're in the in this uh, readability object in the first place. Maybe it will become clear as I continue reading. So here we parse the page URL. I'm assuming this page URL is only needed for the sake of uh, completing links and stuff like that, but let, let's continue on and find out. Uh, so if we fail to parse the URL, it returns an error. This, this should be tested, uh, and that's easy to test. So, so this function should be called, tested directly in the, in the test file. Um, test it once with an invalid uh, page URL. Just put a percent %xx in your URL, and it will fail to parse. That's a quick trick if you're trying to test any code that does URL parsing, put percent %xx, or honestly, percent anything that's not hex, uh, percent non-hex values, and that will fail the parse. You'll get an error here, so it's an easy way to test that. Um, for the input, uh, I would do the same. Find a way to make it fail. Probably send it a reader that, that has no bytes or that returns an error. Um, it's really easy to, to create a reader that returns that. I also have a library I've written with some helper functions. It's called uh, testy. GitLab, not GitHub, GitLab.com slash flimsy slash testy has an error reader type that will return an error. You can uh, use it for tests if you want to. I'll put a link, of course, in the description. Um, so that would allow us to test this error, uh, error condition. And then if we get too many elements, we return an error. That's easy. Also easy to test. In fact, that was tested. So that's the one error that we saw tested. Uh, so this, this block of code is tested. That's good. Then we remove uh scripts okay um prepare the html document i'll look at that later to see what that does get some metadata we'll have to see what that does um try to grab article content okay so here so now, now here we have some of these variables that are just uh scoped to the function which in my mind still probably makes more sense for these r dot variable names but let's keep reading maybe maybe something will change my mind about that um, so if the article content is not nil, so if article content is nil, so that's the return value from this, if that's null, then we jump down here and continue and basically return the result. Good enough. Uh, but let's see if it's not nil, so we actually have an article. We have not found an excerpt in the article's metadata. Use the article's first paragraph. Okay, so this is extracting a an excerpt if we didn't get one. Uh, if we have not found an excerpt in the article's metadata, use the article. Okay, so here, here's here's where we're checking this. If the excerpt is nothing, then we build an excerpt from the first paragraph. Okay, now it makes sense to me. So this this comment probably isn't necessary, honestly. In fact, if it hadn't been there, I wouldn't have been confused because this explains exactly what's happening. So yeah, delete this comment. It's explaining. It's not explaining why. Really, it's explaining what, and the what is more easily explained by the code. So delete that comment. If you really want a comment to explain this in more detail than the code itself explains, then move this block to a separate function and call it extract metadata or something like that and let it return this if it's set and otherwise do this. And then it's clear what's going on. Uh, in, in, in reading this code, I, I can see, oh, I'm setting metadata to extract metadata. And it would just be obvious. So either delete this comment entirely or extract this code into a new function. Uh, with a descriptive name so that the comment isn't necessary. And then with that extra function, you can put extra comments uh, in GoDoc on that function if you really want to anyway. Okay, so I'm I'm actually quite confused now. So I, I don't see these um, instance variables being used. So th this one is used right here. I'm going to pull this up in my IDE because it's easier to, to bounce around that way. So, so this variable appears to be used within this function and also within a couple of other methods. So that, that's why it's a member of this struct. 
Um, but I think this is a, a bad approach uh, for the reasons I explained about concurrency uh, and just cleanliness. So one of two things I would do, either use a different struct type that is constructed for each call to parse and then make these methods members of that struct or probably easier, just pass these variables around. Exactly which approach I would take would depend on, uh, I, I would need to start refactoring to see which one makes the most sense, but I would take one of those two approaches. Uh, the, the, the key is that these should not be members of the readability struct because that prevents this readability struct from being used concurrently. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm not gonna look at each one of these. I'm just gonna make a blanket statement. These should not be part of the readability struct they should just all of this should just be deleted and made local variables uh, to the to the function uh, then you, by doing that one thing alone this uh, entire uh, method becomes concurrency safe as far as I can tell there might be some corner case that I, I didn't see since I didn't look at every detail but find a way to overcome that. So, so that that's my biggest complaint so far is that this is not concurrency safe for no good reason that I can tell. Okay, what else can we look at? Um, I probably won't look at everything in this file since it's, it's uh, two thousand lines. Um, I think we've got a pretty good uh, look, but there there were a couple functions I wanted to look at. Let me go back to the GitHub here. Oh, simple enough. Anything that's called script or no script, it just deletes it. Prep document. I'm curious what this does. This, this probably needs a better name because if I'm wondering what does prep document do, then it's not clearly named. Let's see what the description says. Prep document prepares the HTML document for readability to scrape it. This includes things like scraping, stripping JavaScript, CSS, and handling terrible markup, among other things. Oh, what would I call that? I don't know. Um, prep document isn't a terrible name. I mean, it, it fairly well describes what it's doing without getting too detailed. The problem is it's not obvious what it does uh, without that context. I don't know. Think about that one. Uh, that's a yellow flag to me, whether that should be renamed. So it removes anything with a style tag. Simple enough. Um, okay, so if it has a body, it replaces BRs in the body. If it doesn't have a body, it just continues, I guess. Yeah. If it has more than one body, it only modifies the first one, although you should never have more than one body. But I, w I really want some tests around this function. I also have to wonder why the previous method, remove scripts, isn't part of this. And why are we passing r.doc to a, a method that already has r? That's, that's okay. So <laughs> I didn't see that before. There's no reason to pass this here. This should just be operating on r.doc right here. So that's just silly. Fix that. Um, and then I would, I think it also makes sense to move this functionality, remove scripts functionality into prep document. I don't know why we need two functions that do different parts of the same thing. So I would definitely do that. Uh, and this replaces font tags with span tags. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Okay, um, let's look at this from get article. So we already have a function called get article meta metadata. <laughs> but, oh, th this, this functionality of determining the excerpt should be in, inside of here, I think. Let me look at this and see if I change my mind, but I think it should be in there. Here we fetch the, yeah, the metadata, and then we go through each node and some modifications, I guess. So I would I would extract each of these little snippets, get title, get author, etc., to its own function, uh, just to make this code more readable. Uh, if I just had code that said metadata title equals get title, that would be so much easier to read than this long for loop. So it's all these tags that, that I don't really Care about unless I'm really debugging the the title fetching. So I would do that for 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 get title, get author, get excerpt, and then this is the perfect place to put that other excerpt code we saw. So so this is a, a violation of some of the solid principles, right? Um, we we have two related pieces of functionality in different places. So you can't uh, if you need to fix your 
uh, excerpt extraction, you have to you have to debug two functions, uh, and neither one of which only does excerpts. So th yeah, that that that's now become a red flag in my mind. Um, this sh this should be calling its own function called extract excerpt or something like that. It should go through this logic, and then if it's still empty, call the logic we saw in the other file or the other function. Uh, this fun this method right here or this this block right here. Merge those two into a single function. Make your code readable, much more readable, easier to debug, easier to test. Fix that. Uh, and then the same for all these other ones. Um, I, I know these are this is simple. So so here here we actually have th this is the exact pattern I want. Um, just call a function to get the thing and get rid of this comment. The comment adds no value. If you can't tell that you're getting the fav icon by calling a function called get article fav icon, the comment's not going to help you anyway. So delete the silly comments. Um, this code is perfectly readable as it is, uh, and use the same pattern all the way up this, uh, this method, make it, make it much simpler to read. Let me look at the heart of this for each, um, and then I'll probably call it a day. So we're, we're using one of those regular expressions we saw up at the top. If we have any of those, then we convert to lowercase. Don't tell me you're converting to lowercase when you're calling to lower. I know that. Get rid of the comment. Move white space. I can tell that by reading the code. You don't need a comment. Um, was my dollop? Is that a typo or is it a word I'm not familiar with? So often, I think we can tell that that's what's happening. I don't, these, some of these comments aren't, aren't necessary. Now again, convert to lowercase, remove white space. Yeah, we, we know that. They convert. This is completely extraneous. Uh, if you if you can't read that in the code, then the comment isn't going to help you anyway. Okay, I'm going to call this a day. I haven't looked at every line of code, but, but uh, my overall impression here, it's not a bad library. Uh, there's a certain amount of uh, shall we call it design debt that comes from borrow that from porting another library from another language uh, that's that's expected. Um, the regular expressions I think are the biggest sign of that, uh, and I think I suspect that some of the design decisions in terms of where function boundaries are made come from copying the other library. However, I don't think that's an excuse for some of the the bad patterns I see here. The biggest red flag in my mind is that it's not concurrency safe. Given that this is a Go library where concur concurrency is a core feature, um, if it's at all possible, every function, every method, every type should be concurrency safe. And if it's not, you must document so. So uh, the, the quickest fix, if, if this were a library that were in wide use, the first thing I would do uh, five seconds after watching this video is go add a Go doc comment that says this is not concurrency safe. Commit that and push that, or at least then it's published. Then the next thing I would do is rework that that function to make it concurrency safe and remove that comment <laughs> so that's the very first and second thing i would do if i were maintaining this and it was a serious project uh, aside from that there's a lot of readability improvements a lot of comments can be deleted they just are extraneous they, they explain what's obvious uh others other comments uh are should be unnecessary if you refactor the code to be more readable uh, so those are those are my biggest complaints um let's look at the scoreboard First, the good things. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I really like that there are no third-party dependencies. Uh, that makes it really easy to use this package. It's not its not a heavy, bloated package. Uh, I could easily see somebody using something like GoQuery to do this. I'm glad you didn't. Uh, I like the, the package API. Looking at the GoDoc, it was clear that this is not a cluttered uh, package API. It, it just has a couple simple methods on it uh, that are publicly exported, so that's nice. Uh, it has good GoDoc. I like that. Uh, it's, it's fairly well documented. Um, uh, with the exception of mentioning that it's not concurrency safe, uh, or if it is, I, I missed that part. Um, the other good thing I like is that the regular expressions are parsed only once. Uh, that's kind of an obvious no-brainer thing, but it's worth mentioning since it's so many of those. Uh, the longer uh, list is the bad things. Uh, first one, it's really minor, uh, but make it a module. I mentioned that at the beginning. Not good test coverage. And I'm not talking per se about the percentage. I'm talking about the the, the cases. Uh, we tested one error case and one pass case. There are many more error cases that could occur. Uh, some that I don't think the code even uh, addresses, like having two bodies. Uh, so the, the test coverage really should improve. Um, comments uh, are are not done well. 
the they tend to explain what's going on, not why. Uh, if you need to explain what's going on in a comment, you need to refactor your code instead. The finder function uh, should be a package function instead of a closure, in my opinion, uh, just to make the code more readable. I mean, it functions fine, but it, it should it could be made more clear. Uh, I would suggest using more self-documenting function names uh, throughout the package. Uh, the finder is one example of that. Uh, that's not a clear, uh, clearly named function, but there are other examples I mentioned in the in the video. Uh, don't wrap simple loops in functions. Now, I, I think this is really borrowed from JavaScript, where you, know, you use these map functions uh, in the MapReduce sense to to just go through a list of things. I understand why it's in that way. That's not a Go idiom. Uh, just uses a, an inline for loop. Uh, it's it's one extra line of code or two extra lines of code, and it makes the the intent so much more obvious to the reader. So I would I would get rid of the 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 sum node function and, and related ones and just use for loops. I would combine remove scripts and prep document. Uh, I don't understand why those are separate. They seem to be doing the same types of things. Uh, I don't see any reason to be passing member elements into methods. Uh, the r.remove scripts is the example. Although, if we address the concurrency problem that I've, I've also mentioned, then it would solve that problem as well because we would, we would, it would no longer be a member function. Um, so two issues that would probably have the same solution. The two instances of metadata extraction should be combined into a single function uh, rather than spread across two completely un otherwise unrelated functions. Remove obvious comments. And of course, the really big one I already mentioned is that it's not concurrency safe, and, and it should be. Uh, so make it concurrency safe uh, as a stopgap at a comment that it's not. And then finally, um, the one that uh, you know I mentioned it at the beginning, and I'm not really sure if it belongs on this list uh, for the reasons I already described, but the regular expressions. This package could be done without regular expressions or with many fewer of them, and it would probably make it more performant and safer and easier to read uh, but again since we're copying this from another library uh, that may not be worth it in this case so there's a judgment call there so that's my list that's the score uh, i hope you've enjoyed this if you would be interested in having some of your go code roasted uh, feel free to contact me again the website is jhall.io there you can contact me i also uh, produce a daily mailing list uh, on software development and DevOps topics that might be interesting to you. Feel free to go there and subscribe to that if you're interested. Thanks for watching and until next time. <laughs>